There was a guy riding through a forest and he was on the saddle, his feet in the stirrups. He was white knuckling the reins, hair billowing in the breeze. The guy was just shredded, super handsome. I'm not describing a Hallmark movie. I'm not describing the front cover of a romance novel. I'm describing something else. As this guy was riding through the forest, not really worried about anything. He had finally gotten to that point where everything was perfect like that. His hands were snatched from the reins. He was thrown off the saddle. His long hair hung up in a limb. His curls caught him and he was dangling by his hair between heaven and earth. Caught by your hair. Your curls just did the trick. You're now hanging from a limb by your hair. You wanna talk about a bad hair day. I'm describing to you someone we're going to talk about in this series called Hair, Absalom. Say Absalom with me. Absalom. Absalom was King David's son, one of his many kids. King David, if you're new here, he was the guy that took out Goliath and he became the toast of the town. He was king over Israel and just a legendary guy. David, though, had a very, very dysfunctional family. In fact, his family would make the Kardashians blush. This guy had numerous wives, and to be his wife, you didn't have to have a good personality. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he had all of these kids, yet being a polygamist, he knew in his heart of hearts was against God's will because God said in Deuteronomy 17 and other places that you're to have one wife. Well, David thought, you know, I'm gonna have more than one. One day, even though he had all these beautiful women, he, he looked and saw Bathsheba, a beautiful woman, bathing. He called for her, they had relations. And then, this is David, he had her husband killed. Pandemonium.com. That's how you would describe this family. And I grew up in a dysfunctional family. Okay. I grew up in a crazy place. I got you. All of us are dysfunctional to a degree. David, though, really messed up in this part of his life. As far as a military leader, brilliant. As far as a Politician, like the best, a musical genius, a phenomenal athlete. He was the father to our boy with a bad hair day, Absalom. So Absalom was brought up in all of this. Absalom. What do you think Absalom was about? Well, that's an easy answer. Absalom was about Absalom. You could say Absalom was absolute about Absalom. Absalom might have been the first person ever to say, I love me some me. <laughs> Absalom. Absalom. Absalom dealt with some issues in his life. And these issues relate to you and me. And these traits from the Old Testament figure of Absalom really, really come home to roost in our lives because in today's session, we're gonna talk about leadership, we're gonna talk about parenting, we're going to talk about what happens when someone in authority is someone you don't respect, and we're gonna talk about mayhem, and also we're gonna talk about some good stuff at the end. But Absalom was hanging by his hair Really, he thought, I've done it all, but now he's just hanging there. And because he was a sitting duck, 
That is where he died. Because some Navy SEALs threw three javelins into his heart and that's where he clocked out. Here's what's so funny about Absalom because Absalom was absolute about Absalom. First of all, I want you to notice that Absalom had misplaced ambition. Misplaced ambition. When your ambition ends with you, your ambition will kill you. Let me say it again. When your ambition ends with you, it will kill you. We should have godly ambition. Obviously, when we bow the knee to the Lord and he is sovereign and then we, we discover who we are and whose we are, oh yeah, we should have ambition like no one else. Absalom, though, was about Absalom. He's sort of like young people we hear about in today's culture. Ask him, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? I want to be famous. I want to be famous. No, no, really. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? I want to be famous. Absalom wanted fame. He didn't get any affirmation, obviously, or any discipline in his family of origin. What happens to us when we don't have that unconditional love and discipline in our family of origin, we usually will go out and we will work and strive and do anything and everything just to hear those words and feel those feelings we never had in our family of origin. You matter. You are awesome. You are loved. So many of us, when it comes to ambition, when we move away from God, are doing so, again, to hear the applause we never heard growing up. So I understand why Absalom was wheels off. I, I get it. Still, though, he had a responsibility and he could have leaned into other leaders as opposed to his dad. And these leaders could have really helped him. But, but think about what Absalom absorbed while growing up. Well, one day, the Bible tells us that, that David's son, Amnon, Say Amnon. Now Amnon is not Absalom. Another, he's another guy. Amnon raped his sister, one of David's daughters, named Tamar. I told you the Kardashians would blush over this stuff. I told you this is pandemonium.com. Absalom, he just waited. He was like, oh man. The fire's gonna fall. I mean, my father was the giant killer. He took out Goliath with a slingshot. You wait. He's gonna discipline. He's gonna be all over Amnon. He's gonna take him out. So Absalom just waited and waited and waited. After two years, here is what the father David had done during this whole situation. Here's what David had done in rectifying the situation. Here's what David had done about disciplining Amnon. Nothing. Nothing. Come on, David. You gonna let that happen? David hesitated. Why would David hesitate? We'll go back to what I told you earlier. He had committed sexual sin with Bathsheba, his mistress, had her husband killed. And I'm sure David was like, well, I mean, who am I to judge? Who am I to discipline? He didn't want to deal with the drama and the trauma. He didn't want the media to get a hold of it. He didn't want to be called a hypocrite once again. Isn't it true that there is a major daddy deficit in our land? Look at the, some of the activists, look at some of the athletes, look at some of the A-listers, look at some of the movies and 
the music that's being rolled out, so many of these young men are saying, Dad, I didn't have a dad. I didn't have discipline. I didn't have the love. I didn't have the acceptance. And you have this misplaced ambition. Many of us are from homes where fathers just weren't fathers. Obviously, the father's heart of God helps, and that's the ultimate, but also there are other men in the church and other influences you can lean into to help if you find yourself fatherless. David, though, was a poor example here. And the Bible says, if you wanna talk about misplaced ambition, 2 Samuel chapter 14. I wanna wanna read this little section of scripture to you about Absalom. In all of Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. In other words, the dude was strikingly good looking. And the Bible only calls like three or four people strikingly good looking. Absalom was one of those. Let's skip down now to the next verse, verse 26. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time when it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it. Now, does that sound like male pride or what? Hey, my hair is beautiful, it's long and and let's just weigh it. I wonder how much my hair weighed after it was cut. Well, the Bible tells us, and its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard, five pounds. I mean, this guy could have been a testosterone donor. You know what I'm saying to you? He had misplaced, misplaced ambition. Absalom decided because his dad did nothing, I'm going to take over. I'm going to run the show. His dad was the king, the king of Israel. And Absalom was like, I'm going to do what I have to do. What's driving you? What's, what's giving you the horsepower to be ambitious? It should be about God. God is the author of ambition. When we turn over the totality of our lives to him, he'll give us the proper ambition. But in our culture, we struggle so much, don't we? With being famous. Whenever I think about being famous, I think about the frog who was in the pond with all of these ducks. The ducks would always tell the frog how great it was when they would fly south. And the frog one day said, you know what, Ruby, I want to fly south with you and I'm going to take this stick over here and give it to you and, 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 and you grab on either side of the stick and then I'll just grab the middle and you can fly me south. You know, like two, two jets flying and there's a stick and I'll be in the middle. So the ducks were like, awesome, let's go for it. So it became time to fly south and this really brilliant frog got the stick and one duck grabbed one end, the other duck grabbed the other and the frog bit in the middle and they started flying. And the frog is flying. He's thinking, wow, this is the ultimate. I mean, I'm, I'm flying. Look at everything. Look at the perspective. Amazing. Then they kind of flew over a field and a farmer looked up and the farmer goes, whoa, that's amazing. What an ingenious plan. I wonder who thought of that. Well, the frog was so puffed up with pride he had to tell the farmer. So he let go of the stick. I did And it was the end of the frog. Doesn't that happen in life? Oh, it's about me. The Bible says that Absalom, you'll believe this, built a monument to himself. He wanted to be famous after he died. And the pillar is still there in Israel today. But it's empty. (laughs) 
Absalom, though, instead of ending up in this beautiful mausoleum, found himself in a hole with rocks piled on top, an unmarked grave. That's where misplaced ambition can get you. So notice his problem, his issue with ambition. There's another issue he dealt with, authority. He not only had misplaced ambition, he also had misused authority. You show me somebody who has an ambition issue, it's all about me, what makes me look good, what makes me feel good. It's me, Ruby. You show me someone who has an ambition problem and I'll show you someone who has authority issues. We need to get under those things that God has put over us so we can get over those things God has put beneath us. And that will never happen until we surrender our ambition to God and we understand God is a God of authority. It's easy for me to submit myself to some authority figure that's great. Oh, I have no problem doing that, but how about when they're like King David? Immoral. How about when they're like King David? Not stepping up, stepping out and stepping into the lives of little ones. Because, hey, discipline is not easy. It's amazing how kids, you know, when they're smaller, will do what you tell them to do. But as they get older, they'll do mom and dad what you do. And that's what Absalom did. I'm sure he was cool when he was younger, but as he got older, you're talking about authority issues. He said to himself, I'm going to take over the throne. I'm the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. The tower of handsome power. That's what he said. He tried to take over his father's throne. And this desire happened because David didn't discipline his son who raped his daughter. Unbelievable. Incredible. Well, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verses 11 through 12, it tells you about this coup that Absalom is, is a trying to do. And he's talking to different advisors. He said, so I advise you, let all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, be gathered to you, with you yourself feeding them into battle. Now, someone is talking to him, giving him advice. And we're gonna talk about bad advice in a second but they're playing up right to his ego. Then we'll attack him, that's his father, wherever he may be found and will fall on him as dew settles on the ground. Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. Whoa. Mm. He had a issue with forgiveness, didn't he? I mean. His dad had hurt him because he hadn't done anything. So Absalom goes, I'm going to take over your throne. What do you do as a child or as a parent when forgiveness is in play? When I forgive someone, which Absalom should have done here with his father, I'm giving up my right to get even. Oh, he couldn't do that. Oh, he, he had to get even with his dad. Dad didn't spend time with me. He didn't discipline me. He didn't love me. And now he didn't step in. And the hammer didn't fall on Amnon when he raped my sister. Oh, I'm taking over, man. How do you act? How do you function when you have to submit yourself to an authority figure you don't respect? If they ask you to do something immoral, that's a whole nother situation. There's always an exception. But God has that authority issue in your life and mind to teach us and to mold us and shape us into the kind of people that God desires. Misplaced ambition because of the family of origin and just homemade sin. Number two, 
misused authority. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I want to just press the pause button right quick and talk to you about the Old Testament. I'm in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. God reveals himself methodically in the Old Testament. And we need to understand these different revelations. The first one is the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law mentioned in the Old Testament is the sacrificial system. Back in the day, because of man's sin, they would kill an innocent third party, an animal, atoning for the sins of the people. That's the ceremonial law. The civil law is another law in the Old Testament. The civil law is when God was setting up the fact that he is sovereign, that he is in charge, that, that, that you know, he's God. And then the moral law would be different figures in the Old Testament, different texts in the Old Testament, how we can study them and use them and take principles and precepts from their lives like we're doing Absalom and live. But of course, everything was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And salvation is free. It's free. Or is it? Did you get one of these combs? Somebody clap their hands for the combs. Free combs. <laughs> the hairs on your head are numbered. Matthew 10, 30, that's what Jesus said. Free, right? They're not free. Our financial office told me these combs cost at all of our campuses $4,213. There's no such thing as anything that's free. I hope you know that. But see, I'm duped into thinking and I'm the pastor. Oh, I got a free comb. <laughs> A friend of mine gave me this suit. It's free. No, he paid someone who has a store for this suit. Another friend gave me these shoes. These are, these are cool. The owner of a store that I know just gave them to me, free. They're not free. I did buy the shirt. So <laughs> I want you to use this comb as a reminder that you're awesome, you're special, you're valuable, you're one of a kind. God loves you and knows you so well, he knows the number of hairs on your head and also each hair is numbered. So now and then God will show us a little bit of his knowledge, a little bit of his omniscience. So here's what I want you to think about. If you were the only person on planet earth, God would think about you regularly in ways we can't even comprehend. And you're probably thinking, well, there are 8 billion people on planet earth. That's right. But God's love and concern for you is no different because there's 8 billion of us as opposed to if you were the only person on this blue planet. Can we understand that? No. We have pea brains and we cannot put our little finite brains around the infinite brain of God. But, I, but I, I just wanted to throw in, throw in the comb, the free comb. <laughs> salvation is free. You know, uh, salvation is free. It is. Uh, and I'm going to give people an opportunity to give their lives to Christ. That's free. Is it free? No, it's not free because it costs God everything. It costs God his son. The blood of Jesus is the badge of how much you matter to God, of how much I matter to God. Think about that for a second. Think about that, gang. God loves you and me that much. And God loves us so much, he does not want us to have misplaced ambition. God loves us so much, he wants us to have the authority thing right. He wants us to get under authority because when we get under those things, that's that a second ago, that God's put over us, then we can get over those things God has put beneath us and then we'll discover 
what life, ambition, authority, and advice is all about. Because man, Absalom, he tried to take over the throne and now he's asking people for advice and it's like, Absalom, you have the uncanny ability to ask the wrong people the wrong questions and they'll give you the wrong advice. I, had, I have to confess this. Do, do you mind if I confess something? Well, this is church. I used to dye my hair. I was on the bottle, yeah, I dyed my hair. And most of the time I would have some professionals to dye it. One time, years ago, this is brutal for me to say this. We were starting this big series. It was, you know, when we weren't freaked out about COVID. You know. So I started this series and I could tell my hair was just getting too gray. So I asked a couple of staff members, I go, hey, I don't have time you know, to get my hair dyed. It's like you know, a couple hours before the service starts. They said, well, I'll just go to the store and get you a touch of gray, uh, T55 black, and you can just dye it yourself. So I asked their advice and they gave me this advice and somebody went out and bought this for me. So I'm in my office, you know, now it's about, what, hour and a half before before I hit the stage, and so you know, it says you can do it yourself, put the gloves on, all the stuff. And I'm like, all right, man, my hair looks pretty good. It looks, uh, looks great, you know? So I'll walk on stage, and here's what I look like. <laughs> it turned orange. Touch of gray is a liar. <laughs> yeah, T55 black slash orange. <laughs> That's what happens when you ask the wrong people advice about your hair. <laughs> is that brutal? I don't, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> nope. I'm just natural. And when I had hair transplants, this is pretty cool. Dr. Bobak tried to take darker hair from my donor area and put it up front. See, you didn't know that about hair transplants. It's amazing what you learn here at Fellowship Church. <laughs> ask the right people the right questions to get the right answers. I asked the wrong people the right question and I got the wrong answer. My hair was orange. And then I had to go to a professional and get it done right and then it looked good. I mean, not Absalom good, but it looked good. <laughs> and that, that's pretty good. Wives, tell your husbands, like, man, honey, you look Absalom good. <laughs> I just made that up. I like that. Isn't that good? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. He was on the ride of pride and it messed up his whole trajectory. So if you're keeping score, he had misplaced ambition, misused authority, and the last one, misinterpreted advice. He had the wrong advice. And because of all those things, he was hanging by his hair. David's commander, when he was trying to take over David's throne, killed him instead of being put in this beautiful mausoleum. Ah, 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 ah. He was put in a pit in an unmarked grave. Man, the Bible is R-rated, isn't it? For mature audiences only. The lyrics sometimes are explicit. I love that God not only tells us the good stuff, but also the bad stuff. I can identify with that, can't you? Do we have some Absaloms in the house? Do we have some people who have spun on their heels and who've not worked through these daddy issues, who, who want that 
that, that spot. You think, man, if I get to it, that's going to be it. But you're already at it, and you know that it ain't it. Your problem is, is God. You need to give your life to the Lord. Or maybe you're having authority issues, and you're fighting against that authority. Instead of fighting, realize that God has you there for a reason. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always a primrose path. It's not always going to be easy. You're there for a reason. Absalom should have stayed in that situation, but he didn't. And then just think about this. Think about the advice that you're getting as you do life. Obviously, it's from God. I mean, he's the first one, but you're like, I know God, and I know it should square with Scripture, but I also want someone with skin on. Who are you leaning into? There's so many wonderful leaders and so many fantastic fathers are doing great stuff right here at Fellowship Church. I applaud you for your love. I applaud you for your discipline. I applaud you for for dieseling through those hard yards because child rearing is not easy. And something I'm discovering right now, parenting never stops. I'm 59 years old. It never stops. And in certain ways, it's more complex now than it was when I was 35. I mean, I can't do time out anymore. (laughs) Kids are looking for lines. Let me just give you a a brief add on here. I think it's a funny story and I've got, let me see, seven minutes to go. I can tell the story in about a minute. Lisa and I and our family love dogs. We've had all sorts of dogs from bull mastiffs to Dobermans from mixed breeds to, you know, the frou-frou dogs. Most of our dogs have some uh, behavioral issues. They probably reflect the owner. So (laughs) I installed one of these underground little shock things. Now, please, I don't want to hear any or see any hate because I love dogs. Sometimes they're better than kids. But anyway, the, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That was a cheap laugh. You know what I'm saying. It's a, it's a, it's a joke. We're just talking here. So we, we had, um, that was funny. We had underground little um, wires and they had these special collars. And it's interesting how they'll test the boundaries. These dogs, I've had all different breeds do it. You'll watch them get closer and closer. And we have a warning thing. If they keep nothing horrible, but somebody just to kind of wake them up. Kids are like that. Kids want those boundaries. They want the lines. Absalom wanted that from David. He wanted to feel that and hear that. But where was David? Because his family was so complex and sin complicates stuff. That's all another message. Absalom wanted that, but it was not there. So he thought, you know what I'm going to do? Because you're not giving me attention I'm going to go buck wild and maybe now you'll give me attention. We see this happen over and over. So moms, dads, I want to again applaud you and thank you for being here. Thank you for working on this. I'm a fellow struggler as well. But this is some, some cool stuff about Absalom. You know, his name means father of peace. I thought that was ironic. David named him that. Maybe David named him that because he was like, well, that's the complete antithesis of who I am. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I can do another sermon on that one day. But 
Continue to read about Absalom and you, you won't believe the, the detail on this story because this is a very complex story. And it took me a long time to unpack it to where we can all hopefully and prayerfully understand it. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in and convicts us and applauds us and tells us, you know, what to do and where to go with these biblical principles, these principles from God's moral law. I'm going to have a prayer right now. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for not only showing us the strengths, but also the weaknesses of your character, of your characters mentioned in scripture. I thank you, God, that, that you brought us here for a reason. It's not serendipitous. It's not by luck. It's not by chance. We're here because of your providence. And if you're here and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, we have people logged on right now from Africa, India, Mexico, Brazil, France. You're with our online team. If you're in downtown Dallas or Fort Worth or in Miami or wherever, or if you're here in Grapevine, if you've never, ever, ever made the most important decision you'll ever make, you can make it right now. You might be going, how, Ed? By saying, Jesus, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins and I believe Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Just say that. And right now, I ask you to come into my life, to forgive me, to cleanse me. And I give everything, ambition, authority, advice. I give everything to you, Lord Jesus. If you said that prayer with me, it's the best decision you'll ever make. You know, we can choose our choices and you've chosen the greatest choice that you can ever make. And the consequences are eternal. So if you said that prayer with me, would everyone look at me just for a second? If you shared that prayer with me and I included you in that prayer and you know who you are, again, that's awesome. And let's uh, give everybody a round of applause for making that decision.